All right. Thanks so much for being here. Um, my name is Emma Louie, and I am the National Water Campaigner with the Council of Canadians. I'm here with Caleb Bain from Northeastern British Columbia and Dr. Kathleen Nolan from the Concerned Health Professionals of New York, and we're here to call for federal action on fracking. Uh, fracking has garnered a lot of public attention and is one of the biggest threats to water of our time. There's been a wave of moratoria in eastern Canada where governments are listening to communities and protecting water sources is community health and curbing climate change but com communities sorry but fracking continues in the west and the north landowners in alberta and indigenous communities like fort nelson first nation continue to draw attention to water sources that are under threat members of the liard first nation in the yukon are demanding that they be adequately consulted and in the yukon fracking is is just is just beginning the government has recently opened up the territory to hydraulic fracturing there are a number of areas where the federal government has responsibility to regulate fracking, but there are areas where the federal government is missing in action. In, with the Fisheries Act, there are fracking wastewater disposal projects in Atlantic Canada that if approved, they could see fracking wastewater discharge into local rivers and then into the Bay of Fundy. Communities have major concerns about the lack of disclosure and assessment of fracking chemicals. There are roughly 200 chemicals that we know about that are commonly used in fracking that haven't been assessed by Health Canada or Environment Canada. Canada has endorsed the UN resolutions recognizing the human right to water and sanitation and is obligated to protect water sources from pollution, but we haven't seen federal action to implement the human right to water and sanitation. The Council of Canadian Academies report, which was released last year, highlighted that the majority of fracking happens on indige Indigenous lands, which also falls under federal jurisdiction, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People calls for free prior and informed consent to be obtained. Not only has the Harper government gutted environmental legislation, but they're even failing in fulfilling current obligations. At the end of January, there were 1,838 drinking water advisories in place in Canada. We need a national water policy that addresses threats to water, such as fracking. And with the upcoming federal election, the Council of Canadians hopes to see real federal leadership and commitments to protect communities, public health, our water, and water sources from fracking. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kathleen Nolan, a pediatrician and bioethicist with Concerned Health Professionals of New York. And uh, in New York, we have recently had a decision by the governor and the Department of Health director that the, no permits will be issued for hydraulic fracturing, this process of injecting uh, millions of gallons of water with chemicals into the earth and then exploding underground to release um, natural gas and its related compounds. There is a rapidly emerging uh, body of evidence that shows harms from this activity at every stage of the process with contaminations of air, water, and soil. Uh, this information is now reaching the peer-reviewed literature and the charts that I have here show that over the past five years we've gone from having almost no peer-reviewed literature documenting these harms to having hundreds of papers on every aspect of the process. So we're calling on the government of Canada to use very creative, um, very forceful means to try to interrupt the contaminations, to avoid earthquakes that are associated with this activity, to avoid depletion of drinking water aquifers, and to avoid the uh, ruining of the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat with the materials that have been put into the earth and the even more dangerous materials that come back up uh, in the fracking process. <clears throat> uh, thank you. My name is Caleb Bain. I'm Echo Dene and Deneza, and I acknowledge my presence in Algonquin territory. Um, Working with the Council of Canadians, uh, it has become clear that the federal government um, has an increased role in the regulation of fracking. Uh, there are many justifications for the federal government to begin to regulate this in a more meaningful and substantial fashion. The most obvious to my mind is the national interest doctrine. You know, hydraulic fracturing and emergent extractive technologies uh, that have 
a high risk but low probability of catastrophic results, significant data gaps which are being slowly filled with the emergence of recent peer-reviewed literature over the last five years is suggesting that this is a type of development technology that was never understood at the time of Confederation and Canadians and the federal government of Canada need to step in and regulate this in a more meaningful way. Uh, I come from northeastern British Columbia. We have some of the world's largest hydraulic fracturing operations in terms of volume of water used. Uh, our people have been reporting um, anecdotally for quite a while about the issues associated with this development and it has become clear over time as the science catches up to people's experience on the land adjacent to these developments that more has to be done. I would urge Canadians to understand that absence of proof of harm is not proof of the absence of harm, quite simply. You know, we can't race to the bottom line on energy and energy development in this country without seriously considering the implications, the long-term implications of these developments. There's no technology on this planet that can reclaim a contaminated aquifer. These developments are new types of technology that have grave implications. And if the government, the federal government does not step in, I'm afraid that my territory is going to be lost. And this is to the detriment, of not only indigenous people in this country, but all people. The uncontrolled proliferation of hydraulic fracturing technology has led to domestic overproduction of oil and gas in, on this continent, which is why we're rushing to export it in British Columbia. And in my view, parliamentarians and Canadian citizens need to understand that had we regulated this appropriately, we wouldn't be in such a tough situation today. And I'm concerned, again, emerging science research conducted by the Council of Canadians and others is suggesting that we're only at the tip of the iceberg on this. So I urge Canadians and parliamentarians to step up, get informed, and consider your options. Thank you. Hold on. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first question for Dr. Nolan. Uh, I guess one of the major questions that I always have is, is what exactly is that, that that we know are some of the impacts exactly in terms of what uh, what is coming out uh, in terms of health impact? Well, people are getting sick. Um, when I've seen this, uh, we have first had anecdotal reports, people coming into doctor's office saying they were sick. Now we're seeing that the uh, studies where you go in and you survey, people have um, headaches, rashes that are chemical burns, um, uh, disorientation, loss of balance, seizures. As time goes on, we're seeing more and more complicated pictures of illness. Um, with the air pollution that comes in intensely frac sites, you see uh, symptoms more immediately, asthma, but you will have long-term lung impacts and heart disease. With water contaminations, the, there is a lag time between the time that the contaminant enters the water and then it enters the person and then the person gets ill. If, it's, if there's a well casing failure, you can have a very short lag time. But if this is underground contamination, it could take years or decades before the contaminants reach people and before they show symptoms and get diagnosed. So what we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg in that the people that are sick now are basically our biomarkers, our bioassays. We're not monitoring for all these chemicals in any way other than in animals and humans um, becoming ill. And so when we start to see that illness, we're already um, into, fairly far into this uh, process of contaminants getting out into the environment. This is actually leading up to another question, which is basically the, the I think the biggest elephant in the room whenever you're talking about this sort of uh, process is what precisely is it that, since we don't really know what exactly the, the chemicals are that are being used, and this is perhaps also a legal question, it seems like this is one of those obvious things, well, before we end up saying, or you can end up attributing fully, then you need to know what that list is, and, and since no one has that. We know what some of the common chemicals are because industry has voluntarily disclosed that and we've had some samples from people's property where they've sent them in and we've been able to analyze. So we know that there are uh, extremely toxic uh, chemicals, uh, carcinogens, mutagens, um, teratogens, that is agents that cause birth defects, 
uh, endocrine disrupting compounds, which can have a variety of harmful effects on individuals and their offspring. So we know some of that, but it is a, uh, at present, it's a field where we don't have the complete list and can track each chemical and show its effects. Instead, we're having to see the um, effect of this chemical soup on, on people and animals. Uh, there is the possibility of using um, lower level animal um, models to do some testing to, for these kinds of toxicities. And that's not being done anywhere uh, that I know of so far, would be a good step to avoid having to use humans and see illness in children and families um, before we take action. But we are seeing that. That's the impact of having had um, the birth of an industry and the introduction of a new technology without um, monitoring, in most cases, without controls, without regulation. When you do begin to see illness, then you can look back and say, we, we have a problem that's already underway. I'll go on well, I, I just want, sure, I just wanted to respond to that. In British Columbia, where I'm from, there's mandatory disclosure to frac focus, which is, of course, a website that ostensibly allows for um, assessment of the chemicals uh, being used in fracking. The problem is that that database is problematic and it has marginal value in terms of epidemiology. So any meaningful analysis of the impacts of this industry has to include not only disclosure of what's actually going into the water, but also what's coming back. So even if you get what's going downhole, you need to understand what's coming back up and what's emerging in the U.S. with research on technically enhanced naturally occurring radioactive materials is suggesting that we actually have radioactivity issues far beyond what we had anticipated in addition to the chemical issues and the interplay between chemicals. So, you know, again, when it comes to this issue, we find ourselves a bit behind the eight ball in terms of regulation. Again, that's why myself and many others are advocating for the federal government to step in and regulate this in a more meaningful way. And yes, sir, you had a question as well? Yeah, sorry, I got here, I got here late, so I apologize. Sure. But um, if you could talk about fracking, the fracking industry and the potential for conflict with Aboriginal groups a little bit. Sure. Um, I mean, this is the thing. As Canada becomes or tries to become an energy superpower, what you're seeing in British Columbia and Alberta, primarily with the pipeline fights, is the real interplay on the ground of um, those who deeply oppose the industry and those who support it. So when you talk about hydraulic fracturing, fra hyd hydraulic fracturing is only one component of a larger energy mixture, right? The condensate, the liquids rich gas that comes out of my territory in the Montney Shale, that condensate goes over to the tar sands to create diluent. The diluent is what then allows for bitumen to flow through the pipelines, through the potential end bridge pipeline to the west coast. So any opposition such as the Unistoten camp, which is opposing the Pacific Trails Trans Mountain Pipeline, those ones, you're seeing the um, rise of an as yet um, unformed constituency of individuals who oppose this stuff, whether it's in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, British Columbia, Yukon, Alberta. In my view, um, the decline in the credibility of the regulatory environment, whether it's provincial or federal, at both levels, has created a catch-22 for Indigenous leadership. When you can't trust government, we would like to trust corporations, but their interest is profit. And so what do you do? And what you're seeing now is a lot of grassroots people who stand outside of the formal First Nations, you know, not an Indian band, just Indigenous people like myself who identify by our traditional name, not Fort Nelson First Nation or Smogli First Nation, but Etchodene Daneza. And that definition is creating these groups who are deeply opposed. And it's the 25th anniversary of Oka this year, and I guarantee you the next Oka in Canadian history is going to be in British Columbia, and it's going to be on energy. I guarantee it. The, the, the writing's on the wall, and it's just a question of when, in my view. And that's why the regulators need to step up and regain the credibility they've